maybe you've been to an event or seen something on television where a public statue or perhaps a painting is covered in a shroud. Maybe it's a new product and uh, it's going to be revealed. And at a certain moment, as anticipation is built, they pull the cord and uh, there it is, unveiled. Well, the Bible talks about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what the word revelation really means, uh, an unveiling. Something that was previously hidden is revealed. The scriptures use that expression, the revealing of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the manifestation of Jesus. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they study the Bible, they read the Bible. Uh, men at the Watchtower have years and years of experience and uh, combined, you know, hundreds of years of experience, dedication to scouring the scriptures. And yet, they cannot appreciate the full meaning of the revelation of Jesus. And the reason for that is Jehovah has veiled it. It's hidden from them until a future unveiling. That's why it says in Isaiah, Jehovah says he has guarded secrets that you do not know about. Speaking to his organization, his Israel. Well, one of the methods or uh, vehicles, you might say, that has uh, concealed the significance of the revelation of Jesus is the Watchtower's 1914 teaching that Christ's invisible presence began then. And now all Jehovah's Witnesses are waiting for is the Great Tribulation, Armageddon, and on into paradise. The Watchtower really doesn't say too much about the revelation of Jesus or the manifestation of Jesus. And certainly the parousia of Jesus is pretty much a non-event. It's invisible and everything is, you know, <laughs> it can't be verified. No one can see an invisible Jesus. But the Bible talks about more than just simply the revelation of Jesus. It speaks about the revealing of the sons of God, plural. And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are aware of that passage in the eighth chapter of uh, Romans. In fact, uh, I've got it here. I'll share it with you. This is uh, Romans 8. 18 through 21, where Paul writes, he says, I, I consider that the sufferings of the present time do not amount to anything in comparison with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. For the creation is, e excuse me, for the creation is waiting with eager expectation for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but through the one who subjected it on the basis of hope that the creation itself will also be set free from enslavement to corruption and have the glorious freedom of the children of God. So there are two groups there, aren't there? There are the sons of God who are going to be revealed and there is creation who is waiting for their revealing that they too might be set free from corruption. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses well know that there are two destinies, that God has a purpose to choose a select number, a little flock to be with Christ in heaven 
and to rule over mankind, of course, for a thousand years for the purpose of setting mankind free from corruption. So the revealing of these sons of God means that the kingdom begins ruling at that point. But the question is, how are they revealed? The sons of God are on the earth when Christ comes, when he returns, are they not? So it says the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Well, are there any other passages in the Bible that may shed light on this? I've got a few here for you. Colossians 3, 2 through 4 says, Keep your minds fixed on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, speaking of anointed Christians, and your life was hidden with the Christ in union with God. Hidden, okay. When the Christ, our life, is made manifest, then you also will be made manifest with him in glory. So you notice the word manifest, the manifestation of Jesus. When Christ, our life, is made manifest, then you also will be made manifest with him. How are they manifest? Again, this, this really doesn't shed much light on it, does it? Are they going to be manifest coming from heaven? Or are they manifest in the flesh on the earth? Well, here's another verse. 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verse 6 through 10. And this is where Paul is talking about the revelation of Jesus bringing tribulation on those who make tribulation for you. He says, but you who suffer tribulation will be given relief along with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels in a flaming fire as he brings vengeance upon those who do not know God and those who do not obey the good news about our Lord Jesus. He says these very ones will undergo judicial punishment of everlasting destruction at the time he comes to be glorified in connection with all his holy ones and to be regarded in that day with wonder among all those who exercised faith because the witness we gave met with faith among you. So again, Jesus is going to be glorified in connection with his holy ones in a wondrous way and regarded in that day with wonder. This is, again, the revealing of the sons of God. They're hidden in Christ. No one knows exactly who has been approved. But when Christ comes, then there's the, the sifting work. The wheat are put out. The righteous shine. That's when they are regarded with wonder that they will be manifest as having uh, Christ live vicariously through them. Christ will manifest himself through them. Well, the Apostle John uh, spoke similarly in his uh, first letter, 1 John chapter 2, he says, So now little children remain in union with him, so that when he is made manifest, we may have freeness of speech and not shrink away from him in shame at his presence. Do you know anyone who's shrunk away from Christ since 1914? <laughs> if you know that he's righteous, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness has been born from him. See what sort of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. That is why the world does not know us, because it has not come to know him. Beloved ones, we are now children of God, but it has not yet been made manifest what we shall be like. 
that we, excuse me, not been made manifest what we will be. We do know that when he is made manifest, we shall be like him because we will see him just as he is. Well, this, uh, this really gets into it, doesn't it? Obviously, the chosen ones who are resurrected to heaven will see Jesus as he is. The angels see him as he is now. He's not hidden from them. Jesus being revealed or manifest is in regard to persons on the earth. Did you notice, um, well, I already commented on that, that um, the presence and the manifestation and the revelation are virtually the same thing. And, and that should be evident from that passage. Uh, he encourages us to remain in union with Christ until his presence. If we're not in union with Christ, when his presence began, we, we will have no freeness of speech to approach him. We'll be shamed away. It will be too glorious. We'll be shamed. So obviously, uh, no such invisible parousia has begun. <laughs> That's part of the veiling process. It's interesting. I'm going to read one more passage from Peter. He's talking about the wonderful hope that Christians have of being with Christ in heaven. He said, it is reserved in the heavens for you who are being safeguarded by God's power through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last period of time. I spoke about that a little bit. Obviously, the last period of time is the same as the last days, the final part of the days, the conclusion of the system of things and the time of the end. If the time of the end began in 1914, can we expect another period of time after that? Another time of the end? Well, no. And obviously this last period of time has not begun because that's when the salvation is revealed. He says, because of this, you are greatly rejoicing, though for a short time. If it must be, you are being distressed by various trials in order that the tested quality of your faith of much greater value than gold that perishes, despite its being tested by fire, may be found a cause for praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation of Jesus Christ, same as the parousia. Though you never saw him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, yet you exercise faith in him and are greatly rejoicing with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, your salvation. Well, it's interesting that um, I read passages from John, from Peter, and from Paul. And all three of those apostles saw Jesus of course, they saw him after his resurrection, uh, but um, unfortunately, James was killed, but he was with John and Peter on the Mount of the Transfiguration. And they saw Jesus transformed into this uh, transplendent glory. His garment shone whiter than white, like the sun. And uh, But they saw that. And... Peter, writing years later, said it was not by relating artfully contrived false stories that we acquainted you with the power and the presence, parousia, of our Lord Jesus, but it was having been eyewitnesses of his magnificence. So the transfiguration was a foregleam of the parousia, when Jesus reveals himself to the chosen ones, when he is manifest to them. It is true we cannot see a spirit, and Jesus is most definitely a spirit. 
And I don't think you would want to see him as a spirit because he has the glory of Jehovah. And Jehovah said, no man may see me and yet live. So it, it would be a fatal encounter if you were to actually see Jesus as he exists now. But Jehovah manifested himself in various ways. Up on the mountain with Moses, he had Moses turn around and veiled him and walked behind him uh, symbolically. And when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was glowing, even though he didn't literally see Job. He had uh, a close encounter, you might say. Well, the, the three apostles were on the mountain with Jesus. Their, their faces were not glowing, but they, it symbolized their seeing Je a manifestation of Jesus while they're on the earth. I, I mean, as I say, obviously, they will see Jesus in heaven. But the whole point of the transfiguration is showing a foregleam of Jesus' presence and unveiling to his chosen ones on earth during the conclusion, during the tribulation phase. And so the Apostle Paul had a little different experience. I have spoken and written about this, but I reserve the right to repeat myself, okay? Because, uh, well, uh, repetition, what they say. <laughs> But the Apostle Paul had an extraordinary experience. In fact, he wasn't an apostle at the time. He was Saul the Pharisee, breathing threat and murder, and on his way to Damascus to arrest some more uh, disciples of Jesus. And he was with a few other men on the road, and uh, pow, a blinding light. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was like, who are you, Lord? I am the Lord Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, that was a, a never-to-be-repeated experience. All the other uh, disciples of Jesus, there were 500 disciples who saw Jesus after he was resurrected, before he ascended. He always appeared to them in some fleshly body. It was always different, but we can't see this invisible, but he didn't come in a flash of light either. But after his ascension, then he appeared or he manifest or he revealed himself to Paul, to Saul. And writing years later, then the apostle who uh, was full of spirit by then, he said, after recounting that Jesus appeared to these 500, then he said he appeared to me lastly as if to one born prematurely. Born prematurely. That means he saw Jesus the way the chosen ones will see Jesus. When, you might say, when they are born, completely reborn, called into the kingdom. So, now, as regards persons who are anointed, I mean, obviously, uh, many tens of thousands of persons who have been called into union with Jesus have lived since the time of Jesus. And they've died. They've not had any rapturous experience and had Jesus manifest himself to them. But before each one of those have died, Jehovah has to either approve or reject that person so that upon their resurrection, they either are taken to heaven or perhaps they'll have an earthly resurrection. We don't know. So there, they have to be, each one has to be sealed before death. Uh, Paul wrote, I believe it was, um, in Philippians, where he said that I've, I've run the race to the finish. No, I think that was writing to Timothy. He says, from now on is reserved for me the crown. Yeah, that's right. In, in, in Philippians, he said, no, I do not yet consider myself as having laid hold of it. But then some years later, apparently God had 
signified somehow through the spirit that he had been sealed, he had been approved. And, and that's why Paul could say, I've run the race to the finish and there is reserved for me this crown. But with the coming of Christ, all those who are remaining on the earth will be sealed in mass or rejected. <laughs> but there, there will be the final number who are sealed, who will uh, make up 144,000. That means that, that the calling and choosing and training and all the congregation stuff, it's over, it's accomplished, done. Christ has his team together, even though they're on the earth. And it is to those that Jesus will become manifest, reveal himself, just as he did to Paul. It's supernatural, glorious. And they will, in some sense, be transformed. They will be given entry into the kingdom. And the remaining time on earth, uh, they will announce Jehovah's judgments. And all of mankind will be judged how they treat Christ, or rather, Christ's brothers. Isn't that what Jesus said in his illustration in the 25th chapter of Matthew? The sheep and the goats are judged as to how they treat his brothers. Now, the reason that uh, parable is placed at the uh, end of the 25th chapter is because Jesus had previ previously spoken about his coming to judge his slaves. Some will be faithful, some will be wicked. Those who he's left in charge of feeding and he gave a number of illustrations. And so after he had, like I say, he has his team, uh, then everyone is judged as to whether they, how they treat those brothers of Christ. Because that will be the revealing of the sons of God, the brothers of Christ, obviously the sons of God. So I think... Uh, Pretty soon, pretty soon, the watchtower has pretty much spent itself, served its purpose. I think it's been instrumental in serving as a rallying point for persons who are called and anointed. Uh, but the watchtower will not have any part in the work to come. Uh, Jesus will, what he will do will be totally outside the uh, congregation arrangement <laughs> okay that's about it for today thanks <laughs>